Okay, so rational functions are one of the most difficult functions to graph that we're going to come across. So that's why um, we're going to kind of focus on those for the next two weeks, probably the next three class times that I see you. So we're going to try to do as much as we can now so that we have those notes and so then you can just work on things, okay? So some of the homework isn't due for quite some time. Um, so first, let me remind you about our reciprocal function. So uh, we already know about this function. Let me just write it a little bit bigger. That is our reciprocal function. It's kind of the parent of all types of rational functions. Um, and we're gonna use some notation. We've been, I've been thrown at you a little bit from the start. Um, the ends, uh, you'll notice here, as x goes to infinity, our height is going to zero. And as x goes to negative infinity, this side is going to zero. So that is considered right here as a horizontal asymptote. There's a spot where the graph will never touch the x-axis. We've done, we've talked about that. And then right here, that is a vertical asymptote. There's a section where the, the graph will come across and then it will either swoop up and it will never touch that X value or it'll swoop down. And that happens for every time we have a vertical asymptote area. And so that's the language that we need to talk about, a vertical asymptote and a horizontal asymptote. A vertical asymptote is an X value that we can never cross, never touch. A horizontal asymptote is a Y value that the function approaches but never crosses. So you need to know the difference between those two things. And I'm going to teach you hopefully how to identify what those things are. So let's just take a look at our standard f of x equals 1 over x function. Yes. Really nothing. Yeah, just I just wrote the function bigger. So if we just write our f of x equals 1 over x function, let's graph that together. So uh, you would have a dashed line on the x-axis, a dashed line on the y-axis. We talked about going through the point 1, 1, so that's where 1 is, and negative 1, negative 1. And so it approaches this asymptote, but never touches it. It approaches this asymptote and never touches it. Same thing here. Now it is a function. This section is always decreasing ever so slightly. This section is always decreasing ever so slightly. Okay. So in the example, it says shift the reciprocal function two left and three up. Find the graph and the equation. Now you might recall we've learned about how to move functions. Um, if we want to move a function um, left, we are going to add on the inside. If we want to move a function up, we are going to add on the outside. So I'm going to call my new function g of x. You can call it whatever you want, but I'm going to call it g of x. So if I wanted to add two on the inside, that would be next to the x. If I want to add three on the outside, that would be outside. Now, the most effective way to move a reciprocal function uh, quickly and easily is to first move the actual vertical and horizontal asymptotes, okay? So let's take those vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes and let's move them. So if we want to move this one to the left, it's going to jump over there. So let's draw that one first. So it says we move two to the left. And then it says that we've moved three up. So three up would be here. So I always move my asymptotes first. That tends to be where I move things so that I can figure out what's happening. Now, after we've done that, let's take these two points and move them two left and three up, okay? So if we move this one two left and three up, 
it's going to end up right there. And if we do the same with the other one, it's going to end up right here. So we can say that our vertical asymptote has now moved to the spot negative two. And our horizontal asymptote has now moved to the spot y equals three. Now we're going to be exploring more and more about those asymptotes. So it's important to realize that the vertical asymptote has a, an equation x equals some number. And our horizontal asymptote has an equation y equals some number. Okay, so that should not be totally amazing to you. Um, hopefully you remember how our uh, regular function, our parent function works in blue. Pick up the asymptotes first, move it to the location where they've given it, and then uh, put on those, those points. Now, not all uh, rational functions are exactly perfectly related to our reciprocal function but it's a good place to start. So I always like to start there because to remind you, you already know about some rational functions. So what makes a rational function a little different than our reciprocal function? Well, a rational function is where the numerator and the denominator are both polynomials of some sort. So we could have a long polynomial in the top, we could have a long polynomial in the bottom, and the thing to remember is this part right here. See where it says q of x is not allowed to equal zero. So uh, that gives us the fact that our domain is all real numbers except where the denominator equals zero. So this, these functions have pieces everywhere except where the denominator equals zero. So think of our polynomials. They filled up the screen. There was no breaks in them. These will have some breaks. So if there are two uh, vertical asymptotes, the graph will be broken up into three sections. So it's really important to remember that the domain, everything works except where the denominator equals zero. So that leads us to these questions. Uh, what values of function h would not be in the domain? So all you're going to do is you are going to set the bottom equal to zero. So that's your first step. Every time you see a problem like that, set your denominator equal to zero. Now, we know how to solve quadratics. If we luck out and it's a quadratic, we can always solve it using the quadratic formula. We've been doing the quadratic formula for quite some time. But I've always said if you can factor it, that's the most efficient way. So this is a factorable quantity, x plus 4 and x plus 1 equals zero. So x plus 4 equals um, 0 or x plus 1 equals 0. So x is not allowed to equal negative 4. x is not allowed to equal negative 1. So the values that x of x that are not in the domain would be negative 4 and negative 1. Now I want to talk about writing the domain. There's a gap in this function at negative 4. There's a gap in this function at negative 1. It has two vertical asymptotes. So the domain for this function, I would have to leap across negative 4 until I got to the asymptote at negative 1. I would have to jump across that, but then I could keep going. So you can see I have skipped negative 4. I have skipped negative 1. If you were to graph this in Desmos, it would have three unique pieces to it. There would be a piece from negative infinity to negative 4. There would be a piece between negative 4 and negative 1. There would be a piece between neg or after negative 1 to the right of negative 1. So um, if they just say what values are not in the domain, like this one does, um, we're just going to skip negative 4 and negative 1. That's it. That's what you skip. Okay. So um, let's do the same thing for example 2, except this one says to find the domain. So for our first one here, for f of x, um, we have to look at where is x minus 4 equal to 0. Now, that's a factorable quantity. Um, you could also do x squared equals 4. But remember, if you take the square root, you have to put a plus or minus in front. If you forget to put a plus or minus in front, you have to account for that, or it is not proper. It isn't working. You haven't done it right. 
But if you can factor it, I think all uh, quantities, even this one, it's better to factor it than not. Because if you can clearly see that you have two values. So you're going to skip negative 2 and positive 2. Okay, So you can put a little slash there to remind you those are the values that we skip. So if you were to put this function into decimals, there will either be what's called a whole or an asymptote at those two values. So it would skip over those two values. But uh, Alex wants the domain in interval notation. Okay, So what are we going to do? Well, think about number line order. We are going to skip those two values, but there are pieces everywhere else. So the domain of f, and I'm going to put a little f by it to remind you that's the one I'm talking about. The domain of f, I am going to get up to negative 2, skip it, go to positive 2, and skip it. Okay, so I go from negative infinity to negative 2, negative 2 to 2, and then 2 to infinity. That does say 2 to infinity. Okay, I didn't give myself a lot of room here. Okay, so now let's look at uh, g of x. And let's look at the difference there. If we do x squared plus 25 equals 0, uh, if we factor it, we would have to use i's. If we tried to solve it, we would get i's. If we use a quadratic formula, we would get i's. i's do not show up on the number line. So that means there are no real zeros. So there are no problems with this particular function. Everything works. And our domain for g would be from negative infinity to positive infinity. Just because it's a rational function doesn't mean that there's a problem anywhere. If the bottom gives you i's in it, it would not be a real 0. Yes? No, you can't. It's not factorable. Um, it's factorable only if you do x plus 5i and x minus 5i. Uh, the difference of squares is factorable. The sum of squares is not. If you solve that, you get x squared equals negative 25, which is plus or minus 5i. So the square root of a negative is um, not a real number. It will not show up on your real number line. If you put this into Desmos, it would have a graph with no breaks in it from left to right. You could never, you never have to lift your pencil. It's a perfect whatever shape it happens to be. Yes. Correct. So if you have x squared equals a negative number, then uh, there are no real zeros. So there are no uh, spots in the denominator that are equal to zero. So there's nothing that screws that function up. Okay. So let's take a look at this particular function. It says to find the intercepts. Now, we have done intercepts for functions in the past. Um, they're not super hard to do. Um, the y-intercept, we're just going to plug in 0. So let's do that one first. Um, so all the places that we have in x uh, will be a 0. So on top, we would have 0 minus 2, 0 plus 3, 0 minus 1, 0 plus 2, 0 minus 5. So we would end up with um, negative 3 um, over uh, 5 if we reduce it. So what I did is I reduced the 2s. Uh, three negatives are going to keep it negative. There's only thing left is a 3 and a 5. Now that's y-intercepts. x-intercepts is where the function equals 0. And a fraction will only equal 0 where the top equals 0. A fraction only equals 0 where its top is equal to 0. So what's great is they have factored this for us. 
So the x-intercepts, it will only hit the x-axis where the top is equal to zero. So you get x minus two equals zero and x plus three equals zero. So if they've factored it for you, they've done a lot of the work. They've done a lot of the work. And so we get an x-intercept at positive two and negative three. So if we were to look at this graph, um, it would hit the y-axis at negative three-fifths. It would hit the x-axis only at the points two and negative three. There would be a vertical asymptote here at one, at negative two, and also at five. The bottom determines a holer vertical asymptote. It's only the top that determines where it hits the x-axis. Yes. Um, yes, because a negative divided by two negatives is still a negative. So you can handle the values and the negatives kind of in a separate step. So three negatives are going to keep it negative, And then uh, I reduce down the twos. Any other questions about those ones? Okay. So this is an Alex type question where there's lots and lots of pieces and parts. So let's break this uh, function or this question down. We have the graph to use to help us, okay? Now it says, find all x and y intercepts, check all that apply. Okay, an x intercept is where we hit this line. Do we ever hit that line? Do we ever hit that line? No, so that one is a none. There are no x intercepts because we do not hit the x axis. A y-intercept, we do have a nice y-intercept though. If we look where we hit the y-axis, that's at one. We don't always have a y-intercept, uh, like our traditional uh, reciprocal function doesn't have a y-intercept, but sometimes if it gets shifted just right, you will get a, uh, a y-intercept. Now, let says to find the equations of the vertical and horizontal asymptotes. What x value? Do we have a vertical asymptote at? Four, that's it, it's x equals four. And that's the only one that we show on the graph is just where x equals four, we have that dashed line, we have a spot where there is a vertical asymptote. Horizontal asymptote is this line. It's y equals zero. So remember, our vertical asymptote is always x equals a number. Our horizontal asymptote is always y equals a number. And if they've given you a graph, they will dot that out for you, okay? So this is y equals zero. This is x equals four. And then it says to find the domain and range. So the domain are what x axis or what x values were shown. What's the only x value we don't hit? What's the only x value we don't hit? Where's our vertical asymptote at? Four, that's the only one we don't hit. That's the only value we have to skip. So our domain is gonna go from negative infinity until four. That represents this piece. And then it's going to go from four to infinity. That represents this piece. Do you see how we have two pieces of the graph and our domain is in two pieces? So the domain is in two pieces. Our picture is in two pieces. This piece is represented there. This piece is represented there, okay? Now the range, it doesn't quite coincide with that. Just think what y values do we use? What y values do we never use? We never use y equals zero. We never touch that point, but don't we use everything higher than that? So think about that's y is greater than or equal to, or I'm sorry, just greater than zero. So all the y values greater than zero. How do you use that in interval notation? Well, that goes from zero to infinity. Remember, these are the x's that we show up on the graph from left to right. These are the y's that show up on the graph from bottom to top. The bottom value is almost zero. The top value I can get as high as I want. I can go all the way up to infinity. So there's lots to that, but still not not things that you haven't really explored before. You've, you've explored these things. So they should be some things that you kind of instinctually, you know, don't overthink this, okay? Don't overthink it. 
those things shouldn't be that amazing. They should hopefully coincide with things we've done in the past. Okay. So that brings us to, fat, to graphing. There are seven steps, and I, I will write them up on the board and have them up on the board. Every graph that I ask you to do on the 5-6 homework needs to follow these seven steps. Okay, so let's talk about them. So first thing you always want to do is factor out the top and the bottom. So if it's factorable, you want to factor it first. Now, if there is a matching um, factor on top and bottom, there will not be an asymptote at that spot. There actually is going to be a hole in that spot. And then anything that's left will give you a vertical asymptote. That will allow us to find the domain. So kind of one, two, three, and four kind of go together. Those, those are kind of one step, but I like to break them down to kind of show you the order in which you should do them. And then the fifth thing we're going to find are horizontal asymptotes. They're a little different. I'll talk to you about those rules as we go through some examples. Then we'll find the X and Y intercepts. We've already done that, so, so you've seen that. And then you're able to graph it. Now, when I graph it, I tend to do the vertical asymptotes and holes, then the intercepts, and then I might need some more points. So there, there's lots to the graph. Okay. So let's do one example, and then uh, let's, let's try to try to get these two done. Okay. So <clears throat> first thing you want to do, if it's factorable, let's factor it. Would you agree that I can factor out a negative 2 from both of those things? That's really the only thing I can really factor as far as factoring, but you always want to factor it. Um, when I factor it, uh, I am left with uh, 2x plus 5. Now, you can check that that's true. If you distribute the negative 2, you should get with what you started with. If you don't get what you started with, something's wrong. Okay. So um, first thing we did was to factor. Great. Now, second thing is, are there any holes? Well, that would mean something matches in the top and bottom. So no, there's no holes in this particular graph. But vertical asymptotes, remember, are where the bottom equals zero. So uh, it's where negative 2 times 2x plus 5 equals zero. Now, can't we just divide by negative 2? The negative 2 is not necessary. Negative 2 will not equal zero. Negative 2 uh, divided into zero is still zero. So really, the negative 2 we can kind of ignore. That negative 2 would go away. We can divide it off. And then you're just going to solve by uh, solving for x. And so we get negative 5 halves. So that is our vertical asymptote. So at negative 2.5, we have a vertical asymptote. So I will tell you, I don't usually go much further. I just go put it on. Because that's the first thing I'm going to draw, draw anyway. And since I have that, oh, I'm sorry, negative 2.5. If I put it in the right spot, <laughs> I would put it over here at negative 2.5. Okay. So the domain. What is the only value? Yes. No, it, it would be 2.5, negative 2.5. Just uh, you can put it into calculator 5 divided by 2, and that will give you 2.5. Yeah. Okay. So now that's the only value we have. Oh, you might be thinking these two values, which we'll take care of in a minute. Um, I would suggest since both the top and the bottom have a negative, you can cancel that out. So I'm going to make it like this. Okay. So it's only where the bottom equals 0. So the domain, the only value I'm skipping is negative 5 halves. So it's from negative infinity up to negative 5 halves. Jump across that asymptote, and I can keep going. That's the only value I've skipped. So that means there has to be a piece over here. There has to be a piece over there. Usually they're going to do that sort of thing or that sort of thing. They're going to act a lot like our uh, reciprocal function. Okay. Horizontal asymptote. <clears throat> 
here's some rules we need to discuss and we'll, we'll talk about them more uh, the next you know, time we take, some, take notes. Um, but the horizontal asymptote, uh, what you wanna think about is if the bottom degree is higher than the top. So if the bottom degree is greater than the top degree, the horizontal asymptote is always y equals zero. You don't have to worry about anything else. Just follow along one more time. If the bottom degree is higher than the top degree, then it always goes to zero. So the bottom degree is one, x to the first. The top degree is zero, there's no x's. And so um, that would be at zero. So let's put that on there. Okay, next thing we're gonna find are the intercepts. So the uh, y-intercept, oops, sorry about that. The y-intercept, just plug zero in. If you plug zero in on the top is still negative nine, the bottom is negative 10. Two negatives make a positive, that's nine tenths. So put that on there. Now I'm gonna guess where nine tenths is. Uh, yeah, real close to one. Okay. You have to guesstimate to, for, to a degree. We did not find the uh, x-intercepts. The x-intercept is where the top equals zero. Well, negative nine equals zero. No, so there are no x-intercepts. But didn't we also find that there was a vertical asymptote at y equals zero, so we're not going to touch that line, okay? So what do I know? Well, I know that I have a piece here, and it's kind of trapped in that section, so I'm assuming it's going to do that, right? And you can plug in some points. If we plug in negative one, um, we get, if we plug in negative one, we get, let's see here, we get uh, negative nine, over negative six, which is um, three halves, 1.5. So that's verifying what I'm thinking. So there's a piece here. Follow that asymptote. Follow that asymptote. You can plug in as many points as you want. Okay, now let's plug in, uh, let's plug in negative four. I just want now, what's my piece over here? Is it up here or is it down there? One of, it's locked in that area. If I plug in negative four, I get negative nine over 16 minus 10, which is six. I get negative 1.5. So negative four is negative 1.5. So that just tells me I'm locked right. So that is the graph. The graphs of these are yucky. It's just a thing. That's what they are. They're the hardest graphs you're going to do this year. Well, the, the trig functions are a little different, but um, that's next semester. How about this semester? They're the hardest ones we're going to do. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so um, I plugged in something over here and I thought negative four might be a nice, I just picked it. You can pick anything on this side of negative 2.5. So negative three, negative four, negative five would have been any of those. I figured negative four you know, might come out okay. So I plugged negative four in and that's just what I got when I plugged it in. Yeah, okay. Anything over here or over there, you can keep, you can plug in as many things as you want to kind of verify where you think the piece is going. But there's a full piece over here and a full piece over there, no matter what, okay? So yeah, you can plug in whatever you want. Okay, we will skip this one for the next time, but you should be starting uh, just, you have, these six problems. In the top, all you're doing, you're not graphing it, you're just breaking down the pieces. Um, where is there a, uh, you know, what's wrong with it? What's the problem with it? So you find, kind of want to follow these rules, but I did want to actually skip number three for now. We'll come back maybe. Uh, I do want to talk about number two and number four. Number one, 
the horizontal asymptote is zero because of the fact that my power in the bottom is bigger. But I didn't discuss one like two and four, so I'd like to talk about the horizontal asymptotes for those. Do you see for two and four how the power or degree on top and the degree on the bottom match? When that's the case, the horizontal asymptote will always be the coefficients on your lead terms. So that's just going to be one over one, which is one. This one, see how the degrees match on top and bottom? You just use the coefficients on those lead terms. So the horizontal asymptote here would be one over negative four or negative one fourth. Okay. So um, the main rules we need to know about horizontal asymptotes is if the higher power is in the bottom, it's always zero. If the power on top and bottom match, you just use the coefficients on those lead terms. Okay, and we're going to discuss more of this uh, tomorrow. We'll do that. Tomorrow we'll do this one. Okay, tomorrow we'll do that one. Yeah. Can you tell me which homework we're talking about? 5 5 C? Okay. Sure. Okay. So let's do uh, 56. 56, you are not finding the zeros. You're just listing the possible. So the possible zeros here um, are uh, the P's over Q's. So our P is 4, and anything that goes into 4, our Q is 1. So that's plus or minus 4, plus or minus 2, and plus or minus 1. So that's just the P over Q's. You're just listing them and walking away. You don't have to do anything with them. Just list them and go from there. Okay. That makes sense for what they want for that top section. So uh, for 40 through 45, you know, we're skipping 42 and 44. I, hopefully you got that somewhere along the line. Uh, please skip 42 and 44. Um, let's talk about 40. It says find all complex real and non-real solutions. Okay. So the first thing I would do is I would plug in one or negative one. If we're gonna have a rational value here, um, it has to be one or negative one, you know, based on my P's and Q's for number 40. If you plug in one, you get four. So that's not gonna help us. If you plug in negative one, you get negative one plus one minus one plus one, which is in fact zero. So that means that X plus one is a divisor. Okay, so we're just going to uh, take out x plus 1. Um, you can do that any kind of division you want. I don't care. So if you want to use long division or synthetic division or whatever. Uh, I like synthetic because I can do it a little faster. So I'm going to use synthetic division. Okay, so once you set up your box, you're going to multiply, write it down, add them up, multiply write it down. That's not how I multiply those. <laughs> multiply, write it down, add them up. Multiply, write it down, add them up. Now, uh, remember, this was a cube. So now we have broken it down to be that our function is x plus 1 times x squared plus 1. Now, do you remember how it said to break it down to be um, uh, even complex numbers? So um, one thing you guys can break that up very easily. You were told back in Algebra 2 that it's not factorable, but it can be factored with i's. That's a plus bi and a minus bi. So you can actually break this down to be x plus 1i and x minus 1i. Now, if you set x squared plus 1 equal to 0, you do get plus or minus the square root of negative one or plus or minus i. So, you know, you can factor it to find them, you can solve it to find them, but your zeros are negative one and plus or minus i for problem number 40. So, uh, basically, as soon as you find one, divide it out. Whatever's left, you can use the quadratic formula or possibly factor. Um, 66. We're, we're so running out of time, but 66, um, 
maybe tomorrow we can try to do that one if you want. Okay. And I have extended some of the dates for things, but not Alex. That's the only thing I didn't change. 